Well, welcome to another program of the Monroe County History Club. My name is Michael Carter. Welcome to my wife, Paulette, and my cousins, and my brother, Steve, if he's here. I guess he's not here. Well, maybe he'll make it late. Uh, and many thanks to the American Legion for allowing us, allowing us to host these presentations for the past 11 years. In fact, today is our 11th anniversary. Uh, on a drizzly day in February in 2013, a small group of us, me, Skip Chambers, George Carpenter, Donna Stogstall, Shelby Kaiser, and the late Sarah Robertson met at a small room uh, in the basement of the library. We just talked, shared some photos and newspaper stories. Uh, I had to give the group a name because they said we couldn't gather unless we had an official name. So that's where I came up with the, the, the uh, Monroe County History Club. Uh, the next month, we ended up uh, here at the Legion in the Blue Room, back, back there, just a few of us. It grew from the initial 12 people to, or six people to 12, then 18, and on up. After a couple of years, we saw crowds of 40 or 50, and thought that was crazy incredible. Uh, then we began having our PowerPoint programs, and then Cats TV got involved, and it was game on. So now we average 100 or so. Uh, with a high of 160 last fall for the Bloomington High School program. I think we count around 125 or 130 here already today, something like that. Uh, we never planned on this, honest to God. Uh, <laughs> it just sort of happened, and I think that's what makes it uh, seem even more satisfying. And the Legion affords us the absolute perfect venue for what we do. Uh, and thanks so much uh, for the wait staff. Uh, Brooke and Amanda and Diane, who are uh, doing such a great job. Please be generous with them. Also, uh, of course, we'd like to thank Cats TV for recording our programs for the last over eight years now. Uh, it's a very important service because, uh, as it allows us to upload each program to YouTube for people who can't make it to these programs, people who work and have a real job and people who live uh, far away from here. Uh, in addition, it allows these great uh, local history lectures to be put on display for all those who may follow us down the road. The idea here is to preserve as much local history as possible for free, nobody's charged anything, and that's the way we want to keep it. Uh, and CATS allows us to do just that. Uh, in fact, there are several local history groups, uh, organizations that we work with we all try to support and work together. Besides us, there's Monroe County History Center, of which I've been on the board for about three years now. Uh, there's Monroe County Public Library, IU Photo Archives, Catch TV, and the Wiley House Museum, and probably others. Also, our uh, loyal history enthusiasts who attend and watch, watch our programs on YouTube are much appreciated. Uh, the programs we present here are so diverse with many different subjects covered We've had presentations on stone mills and quarries of the area, RCA, Showers Factory, history of local post offices, history of Hoosier hysteria, old photos from the HT, barns, city parks, and uh, the Monon Railroad and others. And West Baden too, in fact, one of our most watched programs. How many new attendees today? Is there any new people? We got our mailing out late. Did people get emails like on yesterday evening okay we had a problem getting those out hopefully that's behind us uh, hopefully that's figured out if you want to get on a regular email uh, list you can give me your email address and I'll give it to George our guy that sends them out add that to it uh, first of all we have a couple of people who want to make some uh, brief messages uh, Christine Friesel would like to say something oh there she is Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Friesel with the Public Library, and I'm just here to announce that we are finally ready to launch our 19th century digital map of Monroe County. Um, it's called Who's Your Character? Because we're not just stopping at Monroe County. We're dropping pins on historical sites um, throughout the state of Indiana. But we're also highly interested in regular folk, people who did not find themselves worthy of a historical marker. So farmers, <laughs> we'll drop a pin on that. 
But the goal is for that anyone to go to the map called Who's Your Character to type in their address and find out who their character was, who lived on their property in the 19th century. It's pretty simple, but we do need help. Um, so if you're good at reading um, cursive handwriting, for example, um, <laughs> and going, I want to go dig through your property history um, and look at our digital maps, um, just join us. I'm going to leave some flyers on the table at the History Center um, because they are one of our important partners, as well as Monroe County GIS. So this is very exciting, and I can't wait to talk to you about what we're finding um, in April. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. And now uh, Dr. Roger Robinson would like to make an announcement. The, uh, I don't know, can you hear me? Yeah. History Center, uh, Sports History Committee put together this nice $20 book, 300 pages. Monroe County Sports History. Uh, all your grandchildren are in it, I'm sure. We have uh, listed, listed, tried to list all the people that uh, were in uh, uh, sports halls of fame. Now, this is not uh, the Gosport, Steinsville, Shelbyville, Franklin, Frankfurt Hall of Fame. These are football, basketball, that type of thing. And these Hall of Fames uh, are ephemeral. They come and go. The football one in Richmond just went broke. <laughs> The one in Newcastle, basketball keeps going, but they come and go. But we found about uh, 13 halls of fame that are relatively stable. And we listed all the 143 uh, local Monroe County people that are in uh, football, basketball, uh, wrestling, tennis, uh, women's sports, etc. There's some things we just couldn't find, you know, women's lacrosse and uh, men's field hockey, but uh, we'll have a hall of fame uh, eventually. But well, we've uh, listed 143 of these, and these are athletic halls of fame. And you may find uh, some relatives in there that you're interested in. Uh, while we're doing that, we came across uh, state champions from Monroe County. Uh, this IHSAA uh, state champions. So how many state champions have we had? From several. <laughs> very specific, very good. Anybody can do better than that. How many total state championships have been won by Monroe County high school teams? All right, I'll tell you, guess what high school has won the most? Right, Carmel. Carmel. When we have five uh, football coaches, they have 10. If we have 10 tennis coaches, they have 20. Carmel has won 170 state championships. Uh, they just recently won one in swim, girls swimming. It was what, number 40 in a row. Okay. Uh, our high schools won 29 officially, unofficially 38, which ain't bad, and we're about seventh on the list. And most of ours are in what sport? Wrestling. This was the wrestling capital of the state for about 20, 30 years. So anyway, all of these are listed in this 300-page book. Lots of wonderful pictures and uh, in glorious black and white. And uh, cheers for only 20 bucks. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Roger. And uh, Daniel Schlegel, the director of the History Center, has a few words. Thank you, Michael. Um, we have a lot of interesting things going on at the History Center. Several people have noticed we do have some of the Eclipse glasses over here. So if you're in need of those, um, please make sure you stop by our table or swing by the History Center while we have them still. We have a lot of great exhibits that are up right now, including the history of barns, our heritage built in wood, the Indiana Humanities and the Indiana Barn Foundation helped us put this together, and it is a fantastic exhibit. Um, it talks about all the different local barns, and I know Cheryl Munson's here because I saw her. Here she is. Um, Cheryl was extremely gracious with us, and we actually had an IU 3D team come out and you can virtually walk through Cheryl's barn. It's really, really neat. We do have a VR headset if anyone is brave enough to try that. Uh, if you prefer not to, that's okay too. We do have a touch screen right next to that so you can still see the inside of the barn, but you can literally go tour a barn inside the museum without ever leaving and it's a real barn. So it's really, really neat. And we're very grateful for Cheryl for letting us do that. 
Um, but please come out and see it. It is a fantastic exhibit. We also have On the Corner of History about the Eagleson family and David Baker. It is a fantastic exhibit to make sure to come out. And as everyone knows, April 8th is the big eclipse that's coming. The only other full solar eclipse that we're aware of was in 1869. And so our exhibit covers both of those. And if any of you are so inspired, we have two musical tunes that were inspired by the 1869 eclipse. So if any of you wind up getting inspired by this eclipse in April and writing music, let us know. Because maybe we'll put that for the eclipse that comes out in, was it 2164 or something? We'll, we'll put your music in that, that one. But it's a great exhibit. Um, there's a lot you can learn. I had a blast going through that exhibit. So please make sure you can wow all your friends and family when you're sitting there waiting for the eclipse to happen. Um, we also have some upcoming exhibits, including the history of gospel music. It will be guest curated by a doctoral student or a, is he a doctor? He did. Okay, so he is a, a doctor. Dr. Alonza Lawrence will be coming in and we'll, we'll, we'll be having a guest curator work on this. Um, and then for anyone in here that likes quilts, there's the big quilt show this weekend. If you go to that, you get free admission into the History Center. And on Saturday, we have Dr. Tony Dickerson from 1 until 2.30 giving a talk at the History Center for free about quilts. So if you're really, you or someone you know enjoy quilts, make sure you stop by and see us on Saturday. And then the very last thing, two things I have. One, we have spring break activities. So if you have grandkids coming or someone, one of your kids says, we don't know what to do with the kids during spring break, we have free activities, so come see everything. And then we also have our garage sale coming up in June. So it's about that time of year. If you're doing any spring cleaning, think of our garage sale. They're open from 10 until 2 on Wednesdays. And then the sale is coming up in the middle of June, and I have little flyers about that. So stop by and see us at the table after the talk. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Daniel. He brought up grandchildren. It just reminded me, our, our eldest grandson just turned 22 today. That's uh, it's hard to deal with uh, in a lot of ways. And he goes to Purdue, but, you know, that's okay. Uh, here's some uh, upcoming events. March 26th, Nan Brewer will be here. Uh, she's been with the Eskenazi Museum for many years and she's going to talk about the history of the School of Fine Arts. April 30th, Christine Friesel, as you just saw here, uh, be a program called Who's Your Character? Uh, digital Map of the 19th Century. And Roger Robinson was just uh, here. He speaks on May 28th, uh, called State Championship Teams from Monroe County High Schools, 1904 to 2014. June 25th, Kurt Sylvester, he's the state president of the Indiana Genealogical Society, they'll give a program on some of the early settler families of Monroe County, uh, who they were and what they brought to the county. July 30th, be a look at the history of Cats TV, our own Cats TV, uh, which will turn 50 years old this month, older than a lot of people think probably, and uh, talk about their contributions to uh, our county. August 27th, John Summerlot will return, he's given a few programs to look at uh, racially restrictive property covenants in Monroe County's past, something which I don't know much about. September 24th, uh, we gave a history of Bloomington High School once, September, so it's only fair we give the history of University High School uh, from 1939 to 1972 is when they were open, and uh, Dan uh, Dana Kellums of IU Archives is gonna give that. Uh, we have a U school graduate. I always do this to you, don't I? We have a U school graduate here. Uh, October 29th, the history of Bloomington, Monroe County, by the uh, our official historian of Monroe County, Glenda Murray. Uh, November 26th, uh, it's called. Uh, it's by Rosie Gersman, and it's called Smithville: Indians, Pioneers, Ski Bows, and Lake Monroe introduce us to the uh, family names and individuals that helped the area of Monroe County flourish uh, and uh, introduce education and sports. Now. 
leads us to today. We have uh, Jill Vance, who's with the DNR. Uh, she's going to give a program um, called uh, To Build a Reservoir, The Origin of Monroe Lake. Not Lake Monroe, Monroe Lake. Uh, it's a story of how Monroe Reservoir was finally, uh, b uh, the story of, uh, of how it was finally built winds uh, around just about as much as Salt Creek itself. Uh, this presentation, which incorporates numerous historic photos, examines the natural and political forces that ultimately led to the approval of the project. So, uh, Jill, without further ado. Um, we'll try this. So, uh, I am very unused to having a microphone. Um, I'm used to speaking outdoors with no mic, and so if you hear me yelling into the microphone, that's just because that's what I'm used to doing normally. I'm going to try really hard to talk in a normal tone of voice so I don't blow your ears out. Um, so yeah, my name is Jill Vance. I'm the interpretive naturalist uh, at Monroe Lake. Today I'm going to be talking about the history and the establishment of the construction of Monroe Reservoir which are actually two separate but related things. So I'm going to go ahead and explain that kind of right off the bat. Um, Monroe Reservoir, um, as you're going to find out today, is a project of the Army Corps of Engineers, and it refers to the actual body of water. I work for Monroe Lake, which is an Indiana State Park, um, which includes uh, a lot of land. We have about just over 10,000 acres of land. Uh, plus shared management with the core of the, of the reservoir. So uh, Monroe Lake, if you're talking about me and my property, the state park, uh, Monroe Reservoir, if you're actually talking about the bo literal body of water involved. And those are some important distinctions because Monroe Lake is not even the only entity that manages land uh, around the reservoir. The Hoosier National Forest does, the um, department, uh, or sorry, the Division of State Forest manages land um, around there, uh, in addition to the core. So it, land ownership around the lake is a mess. Um, <laughs> it really is. Uh, I don't even always understand whose land I'm standing on at any given time. Um, but yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, to build a reservoir, a history and establishment uh, of the establishment of the construction of Monroe Reservoir, the body of water that is part of what my property manages today. Um, so, so this is a story of how Monroe Reservoir was finally built. And as I said in my promo, um, it's, it, it is a winding story. It winds around uh, almost as much as the actual creek that feeds into it. Uh, so uh, fluctuations between uh, extreme flooding and low stream flow in Salt Creek have been viewed as problematic uh, in this area since uh, the 1820s. And that was when uh, white settlers first began moving into the area, uh, started establishing their presence there. Uh, as far as we know, the Native Americans who had lived there for centuries before never complained about it. They just dealt with it. Um, but uh, it started being an issue then in the 1820s. And the first wave of people uh, who came in, European settlers, who came into this area, largely settled in the hills. And we're going to see if my little pointer works here. Uh, they largely settled in the hill areas. What they would do is they would clear these small uh, hilltop areas uh, around the Salt Creek Valley for subsistence farming. And what they would tend to do is that they would avoid the bottomlands of Salt Creek. So I've highlighted uh, so, so some of these, uh, these yellow areas are areas in, this is the 1856 plat map. These are areas that had not yet been purchased officially by anybody um, or were in public land. Uh, so you'll see some of this is school land. But most of this is what they call swamp land. <laughs> and what was meant by that is that these were these bottom land areas um, around next to the creeks usually uh, that would flood a lot. Um, from regular spring flooding in particular. These areas were considered largely worthless for a very long time. They had a reputation, uh, largely undeserved, I think, but um, they were viewed as being full of disease. Uh, you go down there, you get malaria. I don't know if malaria, malaria wasn't a thing, but whatever you would get, you know. <laughs> you go down, live in the swamp land, you were going to get sick. Uh, so they had that reputation. Uh, but eventually, we had more and more people coming into this area and wanting land for themselves. 
And uh, so these so-called swamplands uh, started to be settled out of necessity. And what people discovered when they finally started farming these areas is that these supposedly worth worthless lands made some of the best farmland in the entire area. They were actually incredibly rich farmland. Um, now, a note on the map here. So you see we jumped to the 1928 map, um, plat map here. This red outlined area is the exact same red outlined area <laughs> that I've outlined here uh, for swampland. Uh, you'll see those blue lines running through. So this is Salt Creek as they thought it was <laughs> in 1856. Uh, map making skills improved a little bit over 75 years. <laughs> Uh, and so here's, here's updated. Oh, no, my pointer died. Ah! Oh, wait, no, there it is again. <laughs> it's thinking about dying. Um, so there's a, a better, improved version of how Salt Creek runs. So the land didn't change, but where they thought the creek actually ran, um, yeah, they got a lot better at tracing that. Um, that's a fun thing about going back into historic maps and uh, trying to figure out where some of these properties were over the years and who owns them. You look, oh, it was right on the south side of Salt Creek. Well, where they thought the south side of Salt Creek was changed a lot <laughs> over time. But, uh, but yeah, you can see all this area filled in um, over those subsequent years. Um, and all of this was then owned. Everything that was once swamp land considered worthless is now being farmed uh, largely. All right, so the uh, Salt Creek uh, watershed uh, itself encompasses about 647 square miles. Uh, Monroe County tends to think of uh, the, the reservoir as being Monroe's reservoir. And I mean, it has Monroe in the name, so that's fair. Um, but where the water actually comes from is almost entirely from Brown County. Uh, that's actually the biggest part of our watershed. We're much more connected uh, geologically uh, and topographically uh, to Brown County. Uh, but about 647 square miles in total, so it's the majority of Brown County is part of the watershed. Uh, the southeastern portion of Monroe County, northwestern Jackson County, and we even have some little tiny pieces right down here in Lawrence County. Lawrence County gets a little bit there and a little bit there. And we even have a teeny little bit over here in Bartholomew County. So we're actually pretty expansive. Now, the main creek runs for uh, 58.2 miles. And it once carried the meltwater that was flowing off of the glaciers during the Illinoisan and the Wisconsin and glacial stages. Uh, that meltwater that was flowing down through these, this valley area uh, was significantly higher than the flow that we see through these creeks today. And it carved the valley out both wide and deep. So you go into the Salt Creek Valley today, there's uh, quite a bit of gap <laughs> between uh, the base of the hills and some areas of, the, of the, uh, the valley. And you think, where does all that water come from? Well, there was a lot more water at one time that flowed through there. And in fact, it also cut it a lot deeper than what we see today. So sections along Salt Creek were once about 65 feet deeper than what they are today because of the volume of water that flowed off of those glaciers, carved it out, and then subsequently, uh, a lot of debris also came off of those glaciers and filled it right back in. <laughs> so, so the floor that we see now um, of the creek, the actual floor floor is buried under a lot of glacial sediment. Uh, in addition to glacial material, a uh, primary source of the sediment that filled in the valley came and still comes to this day from the tributaries that are flowing into Salt Creek. Uh, Salt Creek itself is a pretty slow flowing river, <laughs> normally, outside of flood stage. Uh, it, it normally just is kind of meandering. It has a uh, average drop per mile of only two feet. That's the elevation drop per mile on average. Uh, the tributaries, however, that feed into Salt Creek are largely a different story. You think about the topography of Brown County, where most of our water is coming from, the hills and the hollers. Uh, there are a lot of sharp ravines in there. The tributaries uh, that flow into Salt Creek have drops of up to 30 feet per mile. And that sets up conditions for a lot of erosion 
along those tributaries, roading off the sediment and sending it down into Salt Creek. So uh, adding to that, the bedrock that underlies most of the Salt Creek watershed is siltstone and sandstone. Um, so this is a little, this is another thing I said, there's a lot of ways really that um, where I work, we're, we're so much more tied to Brown County in so many ways um, if we throw out the political boundaries. Um, because you think of, we think of Monroe County, we think of the Bloomington area as being, you know, what rock are we known for? Limestone, oh, it's all limestone. Uh, well, Brown County is not limestone. Brown County is sandstone and siltstone. And the area where the lake is, is almost entirely siltstone and sandstone as well. We've got the same rock that they do right over here in Brown County, and that is really important. It's gonna come up later in the uh, construction process for the reservoir, uh, because this uh, siltstone and the sandstone rock are different in their properties than limestone. When rain falls in a limestone area, uh, it, limestone is like Swiss cheese. Uh, the water falls on the ground and it percolates down through the rock, through all these cracks and crevices and the limestone, and it heads to the underground water table. When it hits the Borden rocks, uh, the siltstones and the sandstones that are uh, in the Salt Creek Valley area, it doesn't do that. These rocks are very impermeable to water, and so rainfall hits the surface, and a little of it will get absorbed by the rock, um, but very little, and it doesn't filter down through, it just flows off the surface. So uh, what happens then is that most of the water that falls in this area is uh, forced to rapidly co uh, collect and to consolidate in surface streams instead of filtering down into the groundwater. And so the result of that is that you can get extreme flooding uh, from what we would normally be classifying as just you know, a moderate rainfall uh, because everything gets So <laughs> I will try to turn around. The only problem is the projection on this is in different directions. Um, so we get to, you have moderate rainfall, uh, hits the ground, all gets shunted to these same locations, collects rapidly into these streams. And uh, so Salt Creek flooding then functionally. Do do. I... Oh, that's for you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's not helping any of you. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so Salt Creek flooding, basically, it hits above its weight class. It takes what should be just a normal rainfall, and it makes it extreme when it comes to the action on the ground. That's sounding good. Woohoo! <laughs> 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 All right, so then uh, Salt Creek sends uh, both water and all that silt. <laughs> I need something long. Salt Creek is flowing into, this is the point at which it meets the East Fork, 
of the White River near Bedford, Indiana. Uh, that's that convergence point. And then uh, down at the bottom left, that's where the White River uh, then meets up and flows into the Wabash River near Mount Carmel, Illinois. And so all these systems are connected. You know, we talk about uh, Monroe County has a uh, thing where they've marked a lot of the drainages around town to help make people aware of the fact that when water goes to one place, it doesn't stay there. It keeps on flowing, it keeps going downstream, it collects as it goes. So uh, when storm events are occurring over this broader region, you have this outsized contribution of water from Salt Creek that becomes a really critical driver in some of these larger scale uh, flood events that then destroy farmlands, uh, they wash away homes, and they interrupt river commerce. <laughs> just, just try putting it in the stand, Mike, and let her use it there so she's not jostling it around. So Salt Creek kind of screws everything up as it adds this outsized water contribution uh, that really causes this aggravation uh, to downstream flooding events. So the worst pre-reservoir uh, flooding event that we have that has really solid documentation to it uh, occurred in 1913. And uh, at that time, we had 8.4 inches of rain fell between March 23rd and 27th. And Salt Creek hit high water marks during that flood of 569.3 uh, feet elevation along its North Fork, which was, uh, is over by Belmont, and then 521.3 uh, feet elevation uh, downstream at Harrodsburg. Now you can see a photo from in the background here that shows us uh, some of the impact of this 1913 a uh, flood event. Um, remember, all of our water from Salt Creek is being sent down into the White River. And uh, so this is the White River at Shoals. You can see these houses <laughs> underwater. Uh, one thing I want to point out about the graph here, and because this is something that is still relevant today when we look at flooding on Salt Creek and the area rivers, the rain falls and it doesn't instantly end up in water bodies. It takes time for it to flow to reach those areas. So the rainfall was uh, here from the 27th. Man, my, this is not a good technology day for me. Okay, from the 23rd to the 27th, here is our water flow, but you'll notice it takes a couple of days for hit to hit crest. Um, at the lake today, after a major rainfall, people will call the next day and they're like, how much did it affect their lake? How much is the lake up? We won't know for about three to five days what the effect is because it takes about that long for the majority of the rain to actually make it down into the reservoir. So it takes time there. Um, but the, uh, the water flow for this 1913 flood, um, at the uh, location where the dam now sits. So this is a modern photo. So here's where the dam is. This is Salt Creek flowing out beneath it. Uh, this little red dot right here is where for a very, very long time there has been a flood gauge. gauge, gauge. I'm in Indiana. I can do either. Uh, flood gauge. Now I can't. Gauge. We're going gauge. <laughs> I tell you, 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 ever, you ever watch me doing a flora fauna presentation trying to uh, pronounce scientific names in Greek and Latin, and you'll hear all kinds of fun pronunciations coming out of that. Um, 
But uh, yeah, that red dot marks where this flood gauge has sat for uh, well over a century now, uh, marking the levels of the river. And uh, in uh, 1913, the water going through that point on Salt Creek was estimated to have been flowing through at a rate of 37,000 CFS. That's cubic feet per second flowing through that point. Now that is something, cubic feet per second is enough, like that's hard for me to visualize like what a cubic feet foot is. So you can translate that um, into gallons. So if you picture a uh, gallon of milk like sitting in your fridge, uh, that's going to be 276,779 gallons. And that's flowing through that point every single second during that time. Uh, that is the record crest, the record recorded crest um, that we have for Salt Creek. On March 27th, uh, it hit 40.2 feet above the creek bed. That is now number one right there up at the top. Now, uh, I got to mention some of the other numbers on this list. Um, because there's just, some, there's just some really interesting numbers to look at. Incidentally, uh, I updated this graph in the background today. This is the current stream flow through that exact same point. So we're at uh, 6.37 feet today uh, flowing through that same spot. You can see the 40.2. Uh, that's our record number. Our major, moderate, uh, minor flood stages, the action flood stages are all ma marked. But what I really want to point your attention to is our historic high crests. So um, the US Geological Survey has the 69 highest crest ever recorded for this point available on their website. So they've got this flood gauge data. Um, of those, the top 10 historic crests were all before the lake was built. Um, so there is your, your number one crest, which shows up terribly in that image. <laughs> uh, that number one looks a lot better on my computer, where it says uh, 40.2 feet, and that was uh, March 27th, 1913. That is your number one. Um, all the other top ten in the list were all pre-reservoir. And then just kind of to give you a little bit comparison, What's gone on since the reservoir? Um, so post-reservoir completion, these are the top 10 crests that we have had at that same point since the reservoir has been built. And this number at the side, this is their spot on the overall list. So there's still some older pre-reservoir crests that were kind of mixed in amongst those there. Uh, but that's kind of where it falls post-reservoir for comparison for our historic floods. Really interesting little side note. Um, I'm not talking about climate change today. It's an entirely different presentation. But I do find it interesting that out of the top of the highest 69 flood events ever recorded at this location, not a single one of them occurred during the first 32 years of the reservoir operation. Uh, this resurgence of higher flood events at this gauge location, uh, this is a recent phenomenon. Um, and two of them in particular that I have starred because they stand out a lot to me. <laughs> um, that number 20 on the overall list, May 4th, 2011. Um, I, was, I moved over to Monroe Lake in 2011. Um, this is the highest uh, that the reservoir has ever gotten itself. All right, so this we're looking at the level below stream. So you gotta remember the core is now controlling flow out from the dam. Um, but the water inside the dam in 2011, uh, we hit the highest that we have ever been, or 2000, yeah, 2011, highest we've ever been. We hit 19.1 feet above normal pool. Now the dam sits at 18 feet above normal pool. We'll get into that a little bit later. But this is notable for me because when I started at the lake in September of that year, my building is, sits right next to the beach, the activity center, and the water had come over a foot 
inside that building and had sat there for a month. Um, my first job uh, when I came over to Monroe Lake was to literally trash everything basically in the building because it was all destroyed by the floodwaters. So that 2011 date, I remember that one well. Um, some of you may remember that too. I have some pictures uh, later on from that. Uh, number 11 on the list uh, also stands out to me a lot. You'll see that was somewhat recently. And I got to point out that there's two from 2019 on the list here. February 8th, 2019, and then again, June 16th, 2019. Um, 2019, to the best of my knowledge, is the longest high flood period we have ever had at the lake. Um, again, if you, if you know Payne Town, if you know where the activity center slash the beach house sits there next to the lake, um, from the last weekend in January until the first weekend in August, I had to boat to my office. The road was underwater, save for one weird week, that entire period. The water has never been that high for that long at any other time in the reservoir's history. 2019 was a huge flood year for us. Um, I got through that and I thought, oh good, 2020, everything's going to be back to normal. <laughs> um, all right, here's another picture from that 1913 flood. Um, the entire Wabash Basin was impacted by this flood event. It was not just the uh, the White River tributary. Uh, it, all this water is flowing down into the Wabash. This was a this was a huge regional flood event. Um, the Wabash River itself uh, grew to nearly seven miles in width during this time. Uh, you know, just imagine that. And it was in the aftermath of this 1913 flood that Indiana establishes its first flood control commission. Now, there was another large-scale flood in the White River Basin uh, that occurred in January of 1937. Um, I, w I have not been able to find any good local uh, photos um, of, of Salt Creek flooding or the White River right here really locally flooding. History Center people, if you're listening, if you've got anything in your archives from 1937 floods, send it my way. was able to find this picture from the White River in Hazleton, uh, Indiana in 1937. Gives you an idea of the kind of flooding that we were talking about there. Um, within Salt Creek, we do know that that, that particular flood crested on January 15th um, with a flow at that same, same location that we were looking at uh, la at that last slide of 19,700 CFS, so 147,366 gallons per second uh, was the flow through there. Um, and then had a secondary crest on January 22nd of 16,800 CFS. Uh, there were some other pre-reservoir floods in, this, in Salt Creek um, that, were contrib that contributed to more widespread flooding throughout the White River Basin. Um, there were some notable ones that we know about in 1847, uh, 1856, 1866, uh, 1875, and there was a another pretty big one in 1950 as well. There's also um, a few surviving accounts of a flood event in 1828 that may have actually exceeded the size of that 1913 flood. The thing is, it happened in 1828, and there weren't that many people living here, and there weren't that many newspapers covering it, and um, the newspapers of the time were also very prone to exaggeration. Um, so it's hard to say for sure, but uh, but based on those accounts, this 1828 flood might have been even worse than the 1913 one. Now, uh, these major flooding events that we get, they're almost always occurring in winter and spring. Uh, the storms during this time of year, uh, they tend to occur because you have a warm front coming in, colliding with a cold front. 
Uh, warm air is less dense, uh, so it rises, moves, moves over the top of the cold front, and this contact results then in that warmer air getting cooled down. That produces rain-filled clouds. These are called cyclonic storms. They tend to occur over a large area, and they have a reputation for producing heavy amounts of rain. Now, if we contrast that with what we get during the summer months, summer storms are typically convective. Uh, that means we have the sun coming in, it shines down, it heats up a shallow air, layer of air right next to the ground. This warmer air then rises up into the atmosphere, cools, turns from a gas into a liquid, forms rain clouds, rains down. Convective storms tend to be localized over a really small area. So you know this when you think about it. You think about these big winter storms that we have coming through, they tend to f cover huge swaths uh, of area, whereas our summer storms tend to be these smaller cells, much more kind of hit and miss. So within Salt Creek, oh, I'm uh, sorry. Backing up just a little bit there. Uh, so rainfall, uh, another reason that um, we get more problems with flooding during the winter months is because rainfall during the summer period, even when we get a lot of rainfall, there's other things that can mitigate the flooding during the summer months. So first of all, the ground isn't frozen in the summer. So you can get more absorption into the dirt, into the ground. In the winter, if it hits frozen ground, its only option is going to be to run off. Um, evaporation also is occurring more uh, quickly uh, during the summer months. Things are hotter, the sun is shining more because the days are longer, so you get more uh, evaporation occurring. And then also, of course, we have plants that are growing during the warm months. Uh, they are uptaking and utilizing water as well. So there's less available to just keep on flowing. Now, within Salt Creek, what that means for us is that our highest flow periods uh, typically occur between January and March, and then the lowest flow periods uh, happens from August to October. Now, Prior to reservoir construction, the water flow in Salt Creek during low periods would sometimes actually drop all the way to zero. There would basically be no flow at all. And so you can see um, here in the map, there are some weird years in here flow-wise. Uh, so here's like 1940. I don't know what was going on in January that year. Uh, but notice um, it was even lower later on. Um, by and large, if you, if you take the numbers, you're going to see the biggest, the highest numbers here, the lowest numbers here. So you have uh, this v these extremes in the flow. We're really high, we're really low. It doesn't kind of self-moderate very well uh, in between and kind of even it out over the year. Now, um, as with flooding, extreme low flow in Salt Creek also has downstream implications for those larger rivers. So shallow areas emerge uh, that can bring commercial river traffic to a halt. Uh, businesses that may draw water directly um, out of the, the rivers for day-to-day -day operations may have to shut down because the water isn't available for them to pull. Uh, from a more modern perspective, there's also these negative impacts on recreation and tourism that can occur from low water. Um, so these are some photos. Uh, again, everything here is we have Salt Creek flowing into, uh, is getting down into the White River, White River flowing into Wabash. So whether it's high flooding in Salt Creek or no water flowing off of Salt Creek, we are having an impact on the Wabash. Um, and so, for example, here's this is actually a fairly recent. Um, this is Wabash River, Terre Haute. Uh, in October of 2020, and the river hit a record low of 3.4 feet, um, if, or uh, I said about 1.5 feet if you adjust between the difference between the historic stream gauge and the modern one that was established in 2018. So the previous record had been 2.4 feet in 1934. Um, this is typically underwater. The water typically sits right at the edge of that dock. A uh, huge drought. So you can imagine what a big drop like that in a river, the kind of impact that that can have on commerce. So flooding can screw things off, but low flow can also be a big problem. And so this boom or bust cycle led the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to complete their first comprehensive study 
of the Wabash River Basin, which includes Salt Creek Valley, um, in 1928. Uh, however, at that time, they did not recommend that anything be done to mitigate the problem. They just kind of acknowledged that, yep, this is a problem. Uh, now, following then, though, that record flood of 1937, which impacted the entire Ohio River Basin, resulted in a record discharge of 1.5, or sorry, 1.95 million CFS from the Ohio into the Mississippi River, uh, the Corps revisited the issue. Uh, they recommended then that a series of 45 reservoirs be constructed along Ohio River tributaries to mitigate future flood damage. And included in that was eight, rev eight reservoirs that were recommended within the Wabash River Basin. And so these are all the points where they recommended putting in reservoirs. This, th these two are in Illinois, they're off my map. <laughs> Um, but these are where they recommended putting them in into the Wabash River Basin um, to help mitigate uh, flooding over this broader area. Uh, in 1944, a report by the Army Corps of Engineers Louisville District, uh, this is the first time then that we see Salt Creek specifically mentioned as a potential place for Wabash River flood mitigation. Um, however, no one actually suggested that we build a reservoir in the Salt Creek Basin until 1946. And interestingly, uh, the first person who actually proposed a Salt Creek Reservoir, uh, his name was Professor uh, I. Owen Foster uh, with Indiana University School of Education. And um, he proposed this reservoir uh, for absolutely nothing to do with flood control. Wasn't on his mind. Um, he was worried about the municipal water supply. Uh, Bloomington, as you can see here, is, this is Bloomington population growth going on during this time period. Uh, the population is you know, really growing rapidly. City leaders were starting to be worried about a water shortage, a shortage in water for the, municipal, for the municipality. And so Professor Foster suggested to the Indiana Flood Control and Water Resources Commission that a reservoir be constructed on Salt Creek to serve as a water supply for the city. Um, the site that he would propose was about two miles downstream of uh, State Road 46, uh, roughly in this area that I've got circled there in red, just kind of help orient you here. So you have here State Road 46 running up here. Um, this right here at the time, so this would be um, Roughly 446 today would have been probably still Knight Ridge Road um, at this time. Uh, this is the old university observatory that used to sit right there at uh, what's the four, now 446 in Morris, I guess Morris Pike, um, which was torn down, uh, gosh, just a few years ago. It was still sitting there for a while. Vandalism target, and um, eventually they tore it down. But that'll kind of help orient you. This is the area that he was uh, suggesting building this. Uh, commission examined Foster's proposal, uh, but opted not to move forward with it at that time. Uh, in the summer of 1947, though, the uh, proposal kind of resurfaced uh, with a modified focus. Uh, Indiana's governor at the time was uh, Ralph Gates. He suggested that the commission work with the Corps to examine the possibility of using a reservoir on Salt Creek for flood control. Um, commission staff members met with a Corps engineer, and they recommended that such a reservoir, if constructed, uh, should be placed near the lower end of the stream uh, to get maximum flood control benefits. And so this area is where they were looking at. So, you know, Foster Browns, um, or sorry, Foster Brown. <laughs> I have a friend named Foster Brown. Um, Owen Foster <laughs> was one at his reservoir further north, uh, up by closer to Bloomington, because that's a lot more convenient as a water source. Uh, but for flood control purposes, you want to try to capture more of the water. It makes more sense to have it further down. So he's actually looking right down here, kind of next to Harrodsburg, uh, the governor is for this. Uh, so a little bit of shift there in the location. 
Uh, the commission did continue to pursue the idea through the end of the governor's term, uh, resulted in a report that was issued by the commission's chief engineer in January of 1949, which stated that, quote, the Salt Creek survey can be highly recommended for further study because there is a tremendous opportunity for storage in this basin and a very considerable watershed to be controlled. Now, city and business leaders in Bloomington did not have uh, really any interest at all in the flood control value um, of a Salt Creek Reservoir, but they did see it, again, as a possible solution to municipal water needs. And so in an attempt to keep this process moving forward, a citizens committee filed a pro-reservoir petition with the commission in June of 1949 uh, that was signed by over 800 people. And then this was followed up by a report that was prepared by the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Soil Conservation Service in October of the same year, uh, which surveyed flood water and sediment damage in the Salt Creek Valley. And in 1950, the Soil Conservation Service uh, recommended that a program be established for the East Fork of the White River Basin to establish water, or to um, address uh, water flow and soil erosion issues. However, they did not recommend building any reservoirs. Uh, so sensing that uh, further developments may not happen on a quick enough time scale to meet Bloomington's municipal water, leads, water needs, uh, the city leaders ultimately, they just gave up on the idea of a Salt Creek Reservoir. They turned instead to Bean Blossom Creek, and in 1953, the city itself uh, funded the construction of the Lake Lemon Reservoir, which was completed then in 1956. Um, the, uh, the idea of a, a flood control reservoir on Salt Creek, though, not a water supply reservoir, but a flood control reservoir, uh, this concept was still kind of really slowly grinding forward. Uh, the Louisville District of the Army Corps uh, was authorized to examine a proposed site uh, for a reservoir in August of 1954. And in uh, March 1955, the Indiana General Assembly appropriated funds uh, for a reservoir study in the Salt Creek Valley. The Indiana Flood Control and Water Resources Commission began promoting the reservoir to business leaders, uh, politicians, local organizations, uh, emphasizing the potential positive impact that it could have on local economies. And there were four locations uh, in the Salt Creek Valley that were proposed as possible dam sites. So one of those was located near the town of Payne. If that sounds familiar to you. It's where Payne Town State Recreation Area is located today. Um, this was about 40.4 miles north of the creek mouth. Uh, to build a dam at this location, so to bridge this gap, right here, and uh, put in a dam there in the valley, it would require a dam that was 3,200 feet in length. Now, this site was rejected, uh, not specifically because of how long that dam was, but because uh, it excluded a lot of more favorable storage area down here further in the valley. Um, so it uh, basically what, wouldn't hold enough water, and when it did hold water, it would also end up uh, impacting State Road 46. They were going to have to reroute 46 if they put a dam at that location. Uh, another site that gets proposed is near Allen's, Allen's Creek. This is 34.3 miles upstream of the dam mouth. So they were looking at uh, building it right across in this area. Uh, that dam would have been 3,600 feet long. Um, would have extended right across from the tip of what's of now the uh, Allen's Creek Peninsula um, and gone across uh, that way. Uh, this location was also problematic because of where it was. It was also going to back up stuff uh, to the point they'd have to relocate uh, State Road 46. A uh, third spot that they looked at is under consideration. This one was much closer to the mouth of Salt Creek. So you see, uh, you see Bedford right off here to the side. So they're looking in this area 
uh, very close to Bedford. Uh, you see the creek winding through there. Uh, this dam uh, had the advantages close to the mouth of Salt Creek, so couldn't get a whole lot farther south than this. So you're going to capture uh, you're going to capture 90% of the runoff from the the Salt Creek drainage area by putting a dam at that location. Uh, so that part was good. However, you would have had to adjust, uh, relocate not just State Road 37, uh, but also the Monon Railroad that ran through that area. Um, another problem with this location was that it was located on limestone bedrock instead of siltstone and sandstone. Now, some of you may recall that the city once experimented with building a reservoir on limestone. That didn't go well. We now have a park at that location, uh, Leonard Springs. Uh, Leonard Springs was originally a municipal water reservoir, and all the water drained out through the limestone because it was full of cracks and fissures. Limestone is not a great place to put a reservoir if you want it to remain a reservoir. Um, so that was rejected for that purpose. So the location that they ultimately selected um, was located 25.65 miles upstream from the mouth of Salt Creek. There is a valley entrenchment at this spot, and it meant that the dam only needed to be 1,400 feet long. And uh, A, that number obviously sounds smaller than those other numbers did. Um, but I can also tell you that for a reservoir of the size it ended up being, that is an amazingly tiny dam. Uh, what you could achieve uh, by building at that spot was really cool. Let's turn a fly away. There we go. Uh, so at this location, uh, runoff from 68% uh, of the Salt Creek watershed, that's 441 square miles, uh, could be collected at this location. That uh, corresponds to 7.8% of the total drainage for the entire East Fork uh, White River Basin as a whole. And uh, in August 1955, the Indiana Geological Survey uh, went and they took a core sample of the rock at the proposed dam location. Because again, we had had issues in the past with building reservoirs on limestone. And you know, we looked at that map earlier, uh, most of the Salt Creek Valley is in that impermeable siltstone and sandstone, which is awesome for a reservoir because the water stays there, it doesn't leak through. But where they were looking at um, was on the uh, western end of the Salt Creek Valley. That happens to be right about the point where we get the switch over into limestone. And so they were very careful about taking core samples at this location to make sure that the, where the water would be for the reservoir would not be high enough that it would be hitting into the limestone. They want to make sure it would all be contained within the siltstone and the sandstone level. So this is the actual core that was taken from that very location. Um, this is a lot cooler if you are a geology nerd like me because uh, I took this picture, I held them in my hands. I'm like, this is the very rock. Um, it's, a box of, it's a box of rocks. <laughs> and <then it's> just <laughs> it just takes a certain, I think I saw Nelson Schaefer back here. Nelson appreciates this. This is a cool thing of rocks. Thank you. <laughs> I've got at least one person in here. Um, so they, they took this, uh, they confirmed uh, through this core analysis uh, that the site is well suited to a dam and that the geology at that location would minimize bedrock leakage. So, and it's at a great spot. And so this, this is it, this is the spot. In uh, December of 1956, the Indiana Flood Control and Water Resources Commission uh, released their final report uh, from the reservoir study that had been commissioned back in March of 1955. And according to their economic analysis, uh, the majority of the land in the Salt Creek Valley was not profitable. 
Uh, they noted that the township relied on subsidies from the state to operate. They argued that the state's burden would be reduced by placing the existing land, taking that existing land use and exchanging it for a reservoir. Uh, the value of that impacted land, I've got to say, would later become a major point of contention and litigation. Uh, some landowners accepted the valuation, um, maybe reluctantly. Uh, others really vigorously argued that their land was worth a lot more. Uh, but the commission's report also noted the bipolar nature of Salt Creek. Uh, it was a major contributor to severe destructive flooding in the White, Creek ba in the White River Basin uh, due to these high volumes of surface runoff. However, conversely, uh, the creek often had no flow at all during drier seasons, limited its usefulness in transporting municipal or industrial waste. Uh, they advocated that the ability of a, that a reservoir would have to regulate flow would have significant economic value in moderating both the flood and the low flow periods, both for Salt Creek and all those larger river basins that it was feeding. And then furthermore, trends indicated that the growing population in the area would soon exceed the existing water supply, and a new reservoir was going to be needed to meet that demand. Although this was actually a very minor issue um, in their overall analysis. It was almost like included as a side note. Because uh, then, this is not the city of Bloomington writing this analysis. Uh, Bloomington would put that last point front and center, but that's not what they were actually looking at for this. Uh, so largely left out of the formal discussion was the negative impact that a reservoir would have on the people who were actually living in the Salt Creek Valley. Um, these were largely people who were uh, pretty isolated kind of from the river, from the region's population centers. Uh, they had adapted to this boom and bust cycle of water flow. Uh, a lot of interdependent networks, communities that were based on this system of self-sufficient farming, um, soil, that eroded off the hillsides of Salt Creek's tributaries, uh, flowed down, it settled in the bottomlands adjacent to the main creek every time the creek flowed. And this resulted in such rich farmland that farmers adapted and worked around the flooding cycles. The productivity of these bottomlands was so high that it was often two to three times the state average for farmland production. Um, so high that the farmers, it was worth it for them to flood in these areas and take the risk of maybe losing a crop entirely every few years because the boom years more than made up for it. Now modernization and uh, employment diversification came to the Salt Creek Valley after World War II, uh, along with improved roads that had significant positive impact for people's ability to travel outside the region. Um, however, the valley communities themselves, they remained kind of these very tightly bound um, communities. They had strong family ties, strong connections to this land. And although a lot of these families were, by the time we're talking, you know, here in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, most of the, uh, most uh, these families at least, were not fully dependent on farming for their income anymore. They had the ability to go elsewhere and work. Um, but this remained a really important part of their lives. Uh, farming was still critical to them. Um, these floodwaters were still continuously replenishing the bottomland soil, keeping this land productive. Uh, now outside of the Salt Creek Valley though, the discussions that we see in both the news media and the political circles, uh, they just kind of glossed over or uh, just completely ignored the fact uh, that the reservoir would actually destroy these local values local valley communities and result in the loss of what was considered uh, definitely by the people farming them to be very valuable farmland. Um, the outside discussions kept their focus squarely on how this reservoir was going to benefit downstream communities and commerce, um, reduce major flooding downstream in the Ohio and the Mississippi. And so the project just kind of kept moving forward with very little public opposition, at least no public opposition from people who could actually get themselves heard. Um, 
And so uh, the Army Car of Engineers uh, moved forward with the feasibility analysis here. Uh, they looked at, this is, this is really interesting to me because they ran all these numbers. Um, they looked at the most severe combination of critical meteorologic and hydrologic conditions that was reasonably possible in this area. And from that, they estimated what was called, they called the maximum probable flood. So you think about those weather disaster movies where everything goes as wrong as possible at exactly the same time. That's what they were trying to figure out. If everything went as wrong as possible to the extreme amount that it could at exactly the same time, what could happen from one of these super storms? And they estimated that in our area, such a super storm could produce 15.3 uh, inches of precipitation in six hours and uh, up to 24.2 inches over a 48 hour period. Uh, so if we ever got that, that would give us runoff that it would equate to uh, 522,000 acre feet. So that's if you took 522,000 acres and covered it all with water to a foot deep. That's the amount of water we're talking about. Uh, basically, they estimated that 22.2 inches of that total 24.2 inches would run off. It would create a peak inflow into the reservoir of 266,000 CFS. Again, we picture in gallons here. This isn't going to be a whole lot easier to picture in your head because try to picture a fridge big enough to hold gallons of milk totaling 1,989,818 gallons. It's a lot of milk. <laughs> now, that's again, that's if everything went wrong in the worst possible way at the same time. So that's your, like, your worst case scenario estimate. So from that, uh, what the core does then is they eliminate these extremely rare combinations and they determine then what is your standard project flood going to be. And that basically equates to what's the worst flood that could actually realistically occur in this area. Um, and that for this calculation, uh, they determined was about 50% of that worst case scenario. So they recommended that the reservoir be designed to accommodate runoff equivalent to 11.1 .1 inches of water or 261,000 acre feet. Now the other major section of the commission's report was a cost benefit analysis. Um, they projected that the reservoir could be built <laughs> uh, for nine and a half million dollars. Now, remember that number. Um, I don't know how many of you have experience with the government. <laughs> and uh, what final numbers look like in comparison to projected numbers, but you can probably take a guess where I'll be going with this eventually. Um, so 9.5 million was the projected cost to build it. They divided that out over a projected 50 year lifespan of the reservoir. So this is just very, this is like a cost benefit uh, calculation. If we just say that the reservoir is gonna last us 50 years, what this is equate to is a cost on an annual basis to build this thing, um, $190,000 a year. Okay, so that nine and a half million, that included a um, little over three and a half million for the dam and its pertinences, uh, three million for land and damages, uh, 961,000 for relocations, 838,000 for the reservoir and pool preparation, half a million for engineering and design, uh, more money, supervision, administration, buildings, grounds, utilities, access road, et cetera, et cetera, we add up to nine and a half million. Um, and then of course, once you have the reservoir built, you have to maintain it. So what are the costs going to be to do that? Uh, annual expenses of $376,000 a year were calculated to be what it would require to manage the reservoir for those dual purposes of flood control and low flow regulation. And then uh, they threw in an extra $35,000 for additional maintenance costs, you know, things that could come up. So in total, Costs over that 50 year projected lifespan, if we look at it on annual basis, they projected that to be then a grand total of $691,000 annually. Um, I always like to note the things that these, 
they did not take into account. So they did not take into account interference with overland transportation, meaning that uh, a lot of roads went underwater in the construction of this, and that caused issues. Ask the people who used to live in Elkinsville. It caused major issues. Um, also didn't account for the costs of building recreational facilities and the other development that might be needed around the lake. Um, but included what it did, 691000 a year. Uh, in exchange for a design uh, that would allow the reservoir to also serve as a water supply for the city of Bloomington and be suitable for recreation activities, uh, the state of Indiana was asked to bear part of the cost. And so the state was asked to actually assume 54 0.1% of the total cost here. And so you can see the breakdown. So uh, eventually we get up to 9.9 .9 allocated, and there's our um, federal costs, and then this is what the state is asked, asked to kick in as part of this project. Now, so those are the costs, the benefits that we have for this. Um, Commission calculated that the annual value of flood prevention, so being able to uh, minimize some of the damage from flooding, uh, this would amount to a benefit of about 392,000 a year. Uh, being able to augment those low flow periods, keep the, keep the creek from running empty, help maintain then downstream flow in those other rivers, uh, that, was, uh, reckon, uh, that was estimated to be about another half million dollars in value a year. And then, um, Hearkening back to that analysis that the current land use was not economical, which was an assertion, again, that the people living on that land really disputed. The top of the dam sits at 474 feet above sea level, which is putting it 93 feet above the actual stream bed below. Uh, there is an impervious core on this dam with a rock shell. Um, and if you were to measure all the sediment that they piled there uh, to build this dam, there is 1,127,000 uh, 1, cubic yards of sediment in that dam. Um, a little bit about that engineering of it. Uh, it uses a terracine or a stair step design uh, for maximum strength. There's actually two terraces uh, functionally on each side of the dam. Uh, the lower terraces, here and here are, are at 500 feet elevation, and then you have the middle terraces at 538 uh, on either side as well. And uh, why is this, why do you have this construction where it gets so much wider at the base? And that has to do with the amount of pressure that gets asserted, exerted by the water um, against these sides of the dam. So as the depth in a reservoir increases, so does the pressure that gets exerted against the sides, and the deepest water is exerting that greatest amount of pressure. That's why our submarines can only go so far underwater, because the water pressure gets stronger and stronger the deeper that they go down. It's the same thing that happens right here. And so the combination of these tapered sides and terracing lets the dam, ex the dam withstand that kind of pressure. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of historic photos now from the dam's construction. Um, so, the flow through the dam is controlled by these outlet works. So if you've seen the tower uh, by the dam, uh, this is what it looked like before it was buried underneath the water, or most of it. You can only see uh, basically this top section is all that's visible today. All the rest of this is underneath the surface of the water. Um, but flow is controlled through these outlet works. Uh, inside that 70-foot control tower, there are three slide gates plus two emergency bypass gates. Uh, the gates sit in the lower level of the tower. This is about 20 feet below the normal water surface. And the main slide gates are operated uh, by hydraulic controls. They're 3.75 feet wide. They are 12 feet tall. And they sit inside this watertight housing called a bonnet. Uh, so these are the bonnets right here. Um, think of them like very tightly fitting hats um, that are waterproof. Because the whole point of these bonnets sitting over the slide gates, where, um, where he is standing, and I was lucky enough to go down there myself last year, um, he is below the surface of the water. So if these bonnets 
weren't watertight, the water would just shoot up through there <laughs> and it would fill in the lower portion of the tower. Um, and so that is the purpose of those bonnets. Uh, water then gets released through the gates and enters the conduit. The conduit is circular. It's made of reinforced concrete, 12 feet in diameter, 600 feet long to go through there. And it filters the water and screens as it flows through. Now, an interesting thing that I learned recently is that once a year, so you, know, you gotta imagine there's a lot of maintenance, a lot of safety things that have to go on with maintaining this dam. So once a year, they close off all the water through this conduit and they literally walk through it to check for any possible damage. So imagine 12 foot concrete structure, 600 feet long. Um, my supervisor has, has been on the walk through it himself. Um, I'm thinking about asking to do it with him next time. Um, I have to admit, the back of my head, there's just like this, what if something burst while I was walking through here? Um, but they do, they do a walk all the way through once a year to make sure everything's in good shape. Uh, that water then empties out into the stilling basin. And this is designed, the stilling basin means it's to still the water. It's to slow down the flow rate before the water actually enters the downstream section of the creek. Uh, the minimum release that has to flow out of this conduit um, at any given time to maintain a stream flow in Salt Creek is 50 cubic feet per second. So that's 374 gallons per second. That's the minimum release required to maintain a stream <coughs> flow. Um, however, when it's needed, uh, the conduit can handle a flow of up to 5,140 CFS. Um, the video, I'm going to show you a very short video here. Um, this was from one of our recent uh, higher release periods. And what you see here is a release level of only 2,032 CFS. Um, so this is only 39.5% of what's actually possible. But still, that's 15,200 gallons coming through every second. So this is coming out into the stilling basin before it splashes in. And you can just see the churning in there. But notice how it is reduced before it then exits and heads on downstream. Uh, so there are three pool levels for the reservoir. The lowest one is the silt pool. This sits at a 515 feet elevation. Uh, this is the minimum level to which they will ever lower the reservoir. If the water level, if we ever have an extreme drought and the water in the reservoir ever drops down to this point, that is the only situation in which they will shut off all flow out of the reservoir and we could actually experience another no flow condition in Salt Creek. Uh, that's the only situation in which that would happen. Um, and that is because storage below uh, that 515 mark is, it's called silt pool for a reason. That's where all the silt uh, settles out. Um, imagine releasing basically what was nothing but silt into Salt Creek the level of fish kills that that would cause in downstream areas, the, the interference with commercial operations. That's why it will not go below that point. Um, but uh, if we get, look at the silt pool itself, that silt pool level is 3,200 acres in size and it runs for 22 miles in that. Uh, the reservoir does retain about 92% of the sediment that flows into it. That's about 35,696 tons of sediment uh, enter into the reservoir every year. Uh, it should be noted that sediment does not all settle out linearly. It's not even. Most of it settles out uh, in our backwater areas, upstream portions of the reservoir. Uh, there's less that settles down by the dam. So those of you who made boat out at Crooked Creek uh, State Recreation Area and launched at the boat ramp there, that's our most upstream ramp, um, you may notice that this silt problem uh, has gotten noticeably worse <laughs> over the last decade or so. Um, and that's because that's where most of the silt is settling out. 
there's a lot of silt flowing in in there. Um, so the reservoir actually loses about 0.05% of its storage capacity every year just from silt settling out and filling it in. It's actually, that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, it's actually better than most of the reservoirs in the Midwest. And uh, we have the Hoosier National Forest to thank for that. Because before the reservoir was even a possibility, the Hoosier in the 1940s was coming in, buying up land for soil erosion purposes and reforesting it. And so if they hadn't come in and the land all around the lake had been developed, the amount of silt, the amount of sediment flowing into our lake would be much, much higher. Uh, but because it's all largely forested, uh, we do get a lot of benefits from soil stabilization. Uh, so then we have the low flow regulation pool. This is, uh, sits at 538 feet. This is ideally where the lake is year round. This is the goal, is to keep it right at 538. Um, the, uh, the water below this, so everything between the silt pool level and that 538, this is all stuff that we can use for water supply, to uh, navigate on, to recreate on, to augment the flow of Salt Creek as needed. Uh, we can use all that water for that purpose. That low flow regulation, so this is where, our, this is what we call our permanent pool. This is the light blue section right in here. Shows what the reservoir looks like when we are at that level. Uh, 10,750 acres. Uh, in size, length of 37 miles, and stores 159,900 acre feet of water. And then we have that top level. Uh, that is our flood control pool at 556 feet. Uh, that is, this is all the flood water. So when we flood, this section in here is what we have available to store flood water there. Uh, we can hold on to that much water, excess rainfall, until we're able to release it through the dam without causing additional problems downstream. Uh, and that lets us store a total, so that is moving, that, all that extra is in this dark blue that's running through here. Um, that lets us go up to uh, 258,800 acre feet of water in addition to the low flow capacity and covers an area, if we, have, if we fill to capacity and we filled to capacity in 2011. Um, I remember that, you may remember that. Um, 48,450 acres is then covered by the lake. Again, that's up from 10,750. So we quadruple in size, extends the reservoir length to 44 miles. So in sum, across all three pools, this reservoir is holding 143,699,850,000 gallons of water. Again, visualization is a problem here. So, <laughs> things that I do because I find them interesting. If we were to empty this reservoir in its entirety, and you decide to stand there with your standard uh, water hose and uh, try to refill the thing, how long would you be standing there? I spent way too much time, first of all, finding the average rate of water flow through a standard garden hose to calculate this. Uh, but it turns out that you would, um, you would be entrusting these, this to quite a few future generations because you would have to be standing there for 21,872 years continuously to refill this lake. Um, you could take a shortcut. You could uh, find some Olympic-sized swimming pools and somehow transport them and dump them into the reservoir. You would have to find 220,436 of those swimming pools. Um, Another way to think about the volume of water that we're talking about here, uh, the, the lake capacity um, comes out to 441,000 acre feet. So again, so if you take all the water, spread it out to a foot in depth, how, much, how many acres would it cover? 441,000 is the answer. That means uh, that you could spread out all the water of the reservoir over all of Bloomington and, or all of uh, Monroe and Brown counties together, and you would be standing in water that was just shy of a foot deep if you did that. It's a lot of water. 
Now twice in the history of our reservoir, in 2002 and 2011, the Salt Creek watershed shed has received so much rain that that flood control pool was insufficient to hold the runoff. Um, of course, if we had let the reservoir rise above that level, there is serious risk posed to the integrity of the dam. The last thing that you want to happen is to have water flowing over the dam. Because if you have any knowledge of dam engineering, uh, that can cut a hole into your dam. Think about how much water we just talked about is being held there. Imagine what would happen if that dam failed. Sent all that water downstream at one time. We don't want that. Um, so this is where our emergency spillway comes in. There is a cut that is to the right of the dam that was made right at that flood control pool level of 556. So they cut down through the rock down to that 556 point. And uh, so when the water rises up to that point, and it just starts flowing through the spillway directly into Salt Creek, bypasses the dam and conduit system entirely. I equate this to the emergency drainage hole on your bathtub. If you've ever walked away while filling your bathtub and forgot about it, and then thank God that that thing didn't overflow all over your bathtub, thank it's an emergency spillway, that little hole right beneath the faucet that handles that overflow. That's the, the, the same thing that's happening here. Uh, so it just bypasses it entirely, flows through. That spillway that they cut, that's uh, 750 feet long, 600 feet wide at its base. They removed 992,000 cubic yards of sediment uh, to dig that spillway. And uh, at its maximum discharge, uh, what this can handle flowing through it is uh, 73,760 cubic feet. Uh, per second, so just over uh, 550,000 gallons of water every second can flow through this thing. So October 1964, four years after construction began, um, Monroe Reservoir was formally dedicated. Uh, it was formally dedicated and our operations actually began then in 1965. Uh, remember we talked about the commission's original price tag? Nine and a half million dollars, right? Anyone want to throw out what it actually was? <laughs> 15.58 million. Not quite twice as much. I think that's important. <laughs> Not quite twice as much, uh, but significantly more. Um, that cost did not dampen political enthusiasm for additional reservoirs. Um, the Indiana governor at the time that was finally completed was Matthew Walsh. Uh, he promised citizens that Monroe Reservoir was going to be, quote, only the beginning. Um, and he actually announced plans for <laughs> Indiana to open a new reservoir every year for the next 10 years, including three more that were going to be in that uh, watershed of the Eastern Fork of the White River. Now, that's a plan that never actually came to fruition. Uh, but in October, of 2024. It's 2024. Look at that. Uh, Monroe Reservoir is going to celebrate its 60th anniversary. I got a little side note here, a little promo. In October of this year, we will be doing some special programs um, out at the lake to uh, recognize, to honor, to celebrate uh, that anniversary. But uh, most of our modern day visitors, uh, they're only aware of these the recreational opportunities that are offered by the reservoir. Um, some of them are also aware that they're drinking the water, although a surprisingly small percentage in my personal experience. Um, however, to this day, the reservoir's primary mission uh, remains that of flood control and low flow augmentation. That is still the one and two for the reservoir. Everything else is secondary and tertiary um, to those items. And so it's important to remember that um, well, flooded beaches or uh, shallow backwaters can be inconvenient for recreation. They are also indicators that the reservoir is still accomplishing its mission. And we go back. I got an hour and 20 minutes, which is surprisingly good for me. 
Um, so you're not going to hurt your, my feelings at all if you need to leave. But um, I am willing to hang out and answer um, as many questions as you can throw at me. I got questions. How many years is it going to take for it to fill in with silt? Is a math question. That would be a much better math question for my husband, the math teacher, to estimate. I am sure there are estimates for that. Uh, it still has a pretty long life expectancy. I'm not, I'm not even going to. I'm not even going to. My math, my math brain needs a calculator to calculate a 20% tip, so I'm not even going to speculate in my mind. Yeah. Um, two questions. First yes. one, you mentioned a filter Okay, so she asked about the, the filter and the conduit that uh, the water flows through, and that is to catch debris and stuff of all sorts. Um, that is a better question for the Corps of Engineers to answer because um, I don't have anything to do with the, the maintenance of it. Um, I know they do clean it periodically, but I don't know what the process is to do it. And uh, as far as dredging, um, we have had people from Indianapolis come and look at the Crooked Creek area um, because that's the worst area of the lake as far as silt flowing. And people have gone back there and they stared at it and they said, yep, that's a lot of silt. Yep, that's a problem. Will it ever be dredged? Who knows? Um, they talked about dredging uh, the lake in Spring Mill State Park for about 30 years before they actually did it. Again, this is kind of how government works. What was the life expectancy of the dam? I think it's been 50 years, it's been 60. Well, it's, it's not really, it's, um, life expectancy is a, a tricky term to use. It's not like the same as we talk about life expectancy for a human that we live on average so so much. It's used in cost and benefits analysis and uh, I think 50 years is just kind of the standard that they use to calculate it. Uh, they expect these things to last a lot longer than that. It's just the number I think that I'm, I'm sure there's a reason why they picked it originally but it's just kind of a set number that they use for calculations. How long until it will need to be replaced do you think? How, she asked how long will, until it will need to be replaced. Again, you probably need to talk to the Corps of Engineers on that, The because uh, I also don't have a degree in engineering. Um, I did, however, ask them, um, just out of curiosity, because, you know, we, we think about all these extreme weather events and stuff, and there was a movie preview out recently that showed a tornado, like a super extreme cell destroying a dam. And that just got me thinking, I'm like, could a tornado be strong enough to destroy the dam? And according to the porn, no. <laughs> so we are safe from supercell tornadoes. Um, it, is a, it is a very strongly built dam. It would take, it would take a lot to bring that, bring that down. Everything fails eventually, but we're not in any danger of failing soon. I got a couple of questions. When when the people had to move, how many? And I understand there were several cemeteries had to be moved. Do you know how many cemeteries was affected by this? So cemeteries affected and cemeteries moved are actually different numbers. Uh, but how many had to be moved? <laughs> How many were moved and how many should have been moved are also different numbers. Um, <laughs> the uh, Corps identified at the, at the time, the Corps identified eight cemeteries to be moved. They ended up moving seven of those because uh, they went back and ultimately couldn't find the eighth. Uh, there are, however, at least three additional cemeteries that I've identified that are now underneath the lake that the Corps just simply wasn't aware of at the time. So, uh, and, and also some of the, a couple of the cemeteries that were moved under current poor rules, if they were building the lake today, they would not have been moved. So, uh, so some of the rules on what, uh, what dictates when you have to move at the cemetery, how impacted it has to be have changed 
um, since the 1960s. So uh, one in particular, there used to be a cemetery uh, in what is now Salt Creek State Recreation Area. It, uh, as best as I can tell, it was well, it's, it's well above water level. Um, there was really no reason to move it, but the rules of the time said it should have been moved. Um, it's a really complicated thing. I've got a, I've got a whole nother presentation on cemeteries. <laughs> and the lake. Three or four hundred families affected. Um, I would have to dig into the numbers on the number. I would say 300 might be a little bit conservative as far as the guess. Uh, there, uh, you know, I did a recent program. If you go onto the Monroe Lake Facebook page and go to our videos tab, uh, last week I actually just recorded a, did a virtual program on Elkinsville and how it was impacted uh, by the reservoir. Now that's in Brown County, uh, not Monroe County, uh, but it's, it's one of the more extreme examples of uh, cities, uh, towns that were impacted, communities that were impacted. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about kind of how that played out uh, for people. Um, but you know, mostly the areas around the lake, we, we see shadows of them in names today. Fairfax State Recreation Area, that was the town of Fairfax. Um, most of what was in the town is now underwater off the end of Fairfax. Um, Payne was the same way. Um, a portion of what was once Payne Town is now part of the Payne Town uh, State Recreation Area and a lot of it's underwater. Um, so there was a lot of relocation. Um, and I will say the number of people impacted and the number of houses impacted are also different things because in those bottom lands is where they were farming. There was a lot more farmland for people, their livelihood that was impacted, uh, rather than maybe their direct house was impacted. But when you lose your livelihood, you can't really stay there. <laughs> um, so you know, if everything's underwater but your house, you still kind of have to move, and the property still gets claimed as a, generally as one parcel. Again, that's that's kind of a whole another big big program in and of itself. How deep is the lake? Yeah, how, how, deep, how deep is the lake is the deepest point really depends on what the current water level is. Um, what we typically tell people is um, there are a couple spots around the lake, um, largely where the original creek bed flows, because that is still where we get the most water movement, so we get the least amount of silt settlement. Um, and you can there's a few spots that'll be in the 25, 30 foot depth range in there. I don't know if any really recent measurements have been taken. A lot of the data they last did on that is now like a couple decades old, so they may have filled in a little bit more. But it's it's by and large it's not a deep lake. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. When they uh, excavated that emergency spillway, talk about all that sediment that came out. What did they do with it? Um, a good portion of that was actually reused in the construction of the dam. Um, so. Uh, not all of it, but a good portion of it was reused to make that rock shell uh, that went over the dam. Um, what happened to what they couldn't use for that, I'm actually not entirely sure. They did do some, um, it might have gone into some rip wrapping um, around the lake, but I've never seen a specific mention to what the extra went to. Anything else? Yes. Did they cut all the trees out before they started to fill the reservoir? Uh, they did do a lot of bulldozing uh, of trees and structures. Uh, they did a lot more of that in the main part of the lake than they did in the backwater areas. So the, the backwater areas, um, and you can, you can see this today when we have low water periods. If you go back into our North Fork area, you see the stumps still there. Um, those were not removed, but in the, in the main basin area, they, they just kind of bulldozed that out. I uh, did the same thing with structures and stuff that were left yeah. there. And, and some of those structures were burned down, not necessarily by the people who were supposed to be burning them down. Uh, but, yeah. Um, how many days of high temperatures or, uh, or, or what is, is that what causes this algae, this blue algae problem that can get into the drinking water? Uh, so the blue, the blue algae that, that happens, um, that is a combination of uh, sunlight and temperature. 
and uh, usually in shallower areas. It's not just the thing at Monroe, it's a problem all over the state. Um, and it just happens to be by the, by the time you get to late summer, it's hot, the water level tends to be lower, uh, we have a lot of sunlight, it really facilitates the growth of that blue-green algae. Um, and as you may have experienced, when they treat for that, um, it, it can affect the taste of the drinking water to make sure they get that out. Uh, but it's not, uh, it, it's partially driven by um, fertilizer runoff as well that feeds the algae growth. So uh, there's been uh, some work by, um, shoot, <laughs> the name is escaping me, the, the people who work with farmers in the counties. SWCD. Water. Yes, soil and water conservationists. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> um, they, they have done some work. Um, there have been there some other nonprofits that have been doing some work to try to uh, put buffers in a lot in areas where we get flooding to help stop fertilizer runoff into the lake because uh, that will that just feeds algae growth of all types. And incidentally, all that algae growth contributes to the sediment problem too when it dies so off. So it's, it's not likely that it can actually affect our drinking water? Uh, well, it's it's not, you're not going to be drinking drinking. I mean, it affects your drinking water in that um, the city has to treat it right. to remove it from the drinking okay. water. But, um, but they have a treatment process to remove it. Um, but it's either the, the chemical that they use to treat it or the after effects of the treatment. I'm not sure the precision of that, but it can, there can be an impact on the drinking water taste but you're not drinking the toxins by the time it gets to you. Um, however, in that late summer period, uh, before the algae dies off, so it's particularly in August, and we, t we have our lake tested at our beaches every two weeks uh, to test for what the blue-green algae are. Uh, in that, that second half of the summer in particular, uh, you know, don't let your dogs run into the lake. They will drink the water and they, they can die from that. Um, and we advise for people swimming, uh, we, advise, we allow swimming in the lake up to a certain testing level, um, but we'll get into you know, risk levels based on where it's at. And so if you swim in, in like there's a moderate algae risk level, then you need to make sure that you're showering off right away, um, that you're not gulping down the water <laughs> while you're in there. You need to be more careful of kids in the water who might be more inclined to, you know, gulp some in. Uh, it's a much higher dose to affect a human than affect a dog, um, but it's not something you want to consume. So that process you're talking about in removing it, it's pretty efficient, I take it, in like how long it takes to do that? And the yeah, I know that the process is very efficient. I don't, and it, it gets the toxins out. I don't know how long it takes. Um, that would be the, uh, the Monroe County uh, water folks who do all that treatment, and I'm sure they could tell you in detail about that. That's a outside of my area. I know they do it. <laughs> I know it works, but uh, other than that, I don't know the specifics of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So what happened? He asked about the time frame, kind of for the reservoir to fill up. Um, so the original estimate is that once they had everything ready to go and they were ready to start filling the reservoir, that it would take two years for it to fill completely. Um, and they underestimated Salt Creek. I think filled in six months, filled to capacity. And so what they did is they actually uh, allowed the landowners who were farming down in the valley, they were allowed to continue farming that land until the water came up. And so farmers had actually put in crops in the higher areas, anticipating that they would have time to get an additional harvest off of that. And the water came up so fast. Um, there's a, uh, a story I got uh, from the son of a man who farmed off of uh, what's now Cutright State Recreation Area. And uh, he said, uh, the story he told me is his father was actually out there farming, had equipment out in the field, and uh, the water started rising from a flood event, and uh, he actually had to abandon the equipment and just leave it. Um, the water came up so fast, and the ground got too saturated, and he couldn't get it out. Um, I think he's, his son was trying to remember, I think he, he thought it was like a combine or something um, under there, so 
maybe, supposedly, <laughs> there, there's some farm equipment underneath the lake <laughs> from, from that situation. Yeah, it rose incredibly fast. Um, so all this studying about like what Salt Creek could do, and it just kind of blows my mind, I didn't realize how fast it could have filled if conditions aligned. But yeah, six months. How many bodies have not been recovered that they know people's drowned them? <laughs> um, I can't even speculate on that. That's not something that I would track. <laughs> during the filling process. Um, I haven't seen that document. I'm sure it's buried in the core records uh, somewhere. But uh, again, they've got to, con the, the whole purpose of the lake is to control flooding. <laughs> and so they don't want to let it flow out too quickly. Um, and you know, the side effect of that is we flood ourselves uh, to keep from flooding other people. Anything else? You're also all welcome to come up and Talk to me afterwards, oh, yeah. too. Uh, yeah. uh, what about the Asian carp? Well, aren't they coming up? They're feeding out of the like, Wabash and they're coming up in creeks and that. Uh, can they ever get into the lake? Have they been monitoring? Some people say yes, some people say no. Um, we have Asian carp in every lake uh, already. You're talking about very specific, certain kinds of Asian carp. There are, there's actually four species, and there's a couple in particular, uh, silver carp being one of them that, that people are concerned about. Um, it has been found downstream of the lake. Uh, people have fished them out from right beneath the dam. Uh, people will use the minnows of those carp as bait. Do I believe that people always uh, do what they're supposed to with unused bait and dispose of it properly? Absolutely not. Um, that bait gets dumped into the lake. Uh, supposedly, um, the most problematic species of carp are not supposed to be able to survive, to be able to breed uh, in a lake environment like ours. Now, that could change. There have been some unsubstantiated reports of some of these other species of carp being pulled out of the lake near the dam. They're not officially documented in the lake yet. Yeah. All right, uh, I think at this point, feel free to come up and talk to me if you got any additional questions.